Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike and in this old video, a woman was out driving in the city of Northport, Florida. It was a winter's day, but it was like mad nice out, so, I mean it is Florida. So she was driving down the streets with her windows open. As she pulled up to a red light, however, she heard something coming from the car in the lane next to her. It sounded like yelling, muffled screaming. She looked over and she saw a man in the car and he was staring straight ahead and she couldn't see anything weird from here. That was until a hand came up and started banging on the window. Before we get into it, please click that little subscribe button to see new videos every single week. Now, let's give this dark ass tale a go. Let's begin in Northport, Florida. A smaller community snuggled in between Tampa and Fort Myers, home to the only natural warm spring in Florida. It attracts people from all over the world due to its natural healing properties. It's a magic spring. Population is just over 86,000 people in this fine area. From the area was Denise Amber Goff, born August 6, 1986, to Rick and Sue Goff in Englewood, Florida. Rick, ironically enough, was a sergeant police officer in the Charlotte County Police. In 2008, Denise was the eldest child at only 21 years of age. Her sister Amanda, aged 20, and younger brother Tyler, 7 years younger, aged 14. Denise growing up was always described as like a, a wholesome child. Rick would say he never had any problems, he never worried about her, like, at all. Partying, drinking, boys, they were never the typical problem. She actually never dated until she met a certain Nathan Lee in high school. Her father said the only stern interventions he ever had to really do was tell her to go to bed, while she spent many a night staying up late doing her homework assignments. Although he did mention she was a horrible driver and had a few kind of uh, fender benders. She loved Disneyland, working with the disabled, and was looking to become a speech therapist. Denise graduated magna cum laude, or is it loud, which I think means there's lava in the bedroom, or just means you did real good from Lemon Bay High School in 2004, and very quickly married Nathan Lee, high school sweetheart, on August 30th, 2005. They went on to have son Noah soon after, with second son Adam coming two years later. Denise, at just 21 years of age, was a stay-at-home mom. Nathan, he worked three jobs, count them three! But, but, you know, her being able to be a stay-at-home mother, that was something that was, like, super, super important for all of them. They moved into a neighboring county to a, to a community that was pretty far from the, from their families, but it gave them the life they, they, you know, sought after. A home in a rural neighborhood that they taught, and, and pretty much everybody who lived there thought also, very nice, very quiet, very safe. Denise's father was not initially happy about his daughter's family living so far away, but also set away from the hustle and bustle of life. Nonetheless, he understood the need for them to be able to afford a proper home and offer a good life to their kids. Now let's get to January 17th, 2008. Like many of the cases I, I talk about, it started out like any other typical uh, born ass day, you know? Nathan, he was up and out to work, out to his job, one of his three jobs, kind of three, Jobs that morning, this, today he was working as an electric meter reader. And Nate and Denise, they would talk pretty much constantly throughout the day as Denise was at home with the kids pretty much the entire time. Their last phone conversation was at 11.09 a.m. that morning when they discussed turning off the air conditioning and opening up all the windows of the house because it was, well, to save money. And it was just a particularly beautiful day that January. And Denise, Denise responded she had already opened all the windows in the house to to do some errand. With that, they said goodbye, and Denise mentioned she was going to cut Noah's hair on the back deck that afternoon. He called his wife then again at about 3 p.m. that afternoon when he was getting off work, because they had discussed, you know, when he got home from work, they would go shopping for groceries together. But she didn't answer. He didn't really, you know, think too much of it. He said he'd call her again on the drive home. He'd get her then. Over the 25-minute drive home, he called Denise eight times, and there was no answer eight times. He didn't seem all too worried until he pulled into his driveway. And all the windows were closed. Something like so innocuous that most people wouldn't even notice hit him like a freight train. Feeling a bit odd now, he went into the house and then was anything but reassured. The house was in a bit of a disarray. Two young kids at home. It, it always will be in a bit of a disarray. But that wasn't what, what kind of startled him. 
What did was the two boys sleeping in the same crib, which they had never done before. There was nothing missing, no sign of forced entry either. The only thing missing was Denise, and Nate found Denise's phone and her keys uh, on, a, on a couch in the living room. He wasted no time, and he called 911 right there, right then. Emergency. Uh, I just got home from work, and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house, and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place, and your, I don't know. Your kids are at home by themselves? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm She's not, never done this before? No, 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 no. I don't know where mommy is. This was the very first of five 911 calls made in Denise's case. This was at 3.29 p.m. When Nate hung up with 911, he immediately called his father-in-law, Rick, who, if you remember, was a police sergeant of 25 years. He was a police sergeant in the neighboring county. Rick had also been trying to get a hold of Denise to invite the family over for dinner that night. So when Rick saw that Nate was calling him back, he assumed it was in regards to that. What instead he heard was that his firstborn, you know, his very first baby girl, the, 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 the person who made him a daddy, was missing. He went into action like immediately. And he knew that missing spouses don't necessarily get all the attention they should right from the get go. And of course, the first 48 hours in any case are the most vital towards solving it if you want a positive ending. So he took action right away. He called in favors and contacted colleagues in both counties, Charlotte County where he worked and Sarasota County where Denise lived. Within a few minutes, there were helicopters and officers canvassing the neighborhood when their own needed help, and they took it seriously. One witness who they spoke to very early in this case was a Jennifer Eckhart, who just happened to be, be staying in the house that was right next to Nate's and Denise's, and she said that at around 2.30 p.m., she saw a green Camaro pull up in uh, Denise's driveway, and she saw a white guy sitting inside that car. According to Jennifer, she saw him, this guy was just sitting in this green Camaro in the driveway, not moving at all, for like 15 minutes minutes. Jennifer went into her house, then came back again outside about 10 minutes later, and the car was gone. And so when Nathan Lee was asked, neither me nor my wife Denise know anybody who drives a green Camaro. The police had at this point all hands on deck, and with Jennifer's witness account, they were able to put out a be on the lookout bolo for the green Camaro. At 6.14 p.m., after almost three hours of frantic searching and looking with no news, 911 received the next call in regards to this case. But this time, it was Denise herself. She had somehow gotten the kidnapper's phone and managed to call 911. Hello? In the call, you can hear Denise screaming to help her, and, and she's sorry. She just wants to see her kids again. Denise was smart, the, the daughter of a police officer, and she was giving 911 operators key information while trying to stay discreet to her kidnapper. What is the address that you're at? Hello, ma'am? Where are we going? What's your name? Please, please, please. Are you on I-75? Where are we? She managed to tell the 911 operator her name, the car she's in, that her kidnapper is a stranger, even the address of her house, and that her kids are still there. She was trying everything to get help, and at the same time not to piss this guy off. You can hear in the call the kidnapper saying, where's the phone, a few times with Denise saying, I don't know. She was you know, trying to say this all to, to the 911 operator without alerting the kidnapper that she was using his phone at that very moment, but eventually though, after about seven minutes, he caught on, and the call ended. The officers quickly got audio of the call to both Rick and Nate to confirm Denise's voice. Their reaction was both scared and hopeful. Scared because it is indeed Denise, and that's, you know, she's she's been taken. That's, that's not exactly the way you want to hear your wife's voice, ever. 
scared. They have no idea where she is. They have no idea how much time they have left. But hopeful, because she is still alive. And if she's still alive, there is still time. Quickly though, their hopes were crushed when they found that the phone was not a traditional cell phone, but a burner phone. There was there was no way to track it except local cell tower pings, which, which take time and are not always 100% accurate, not in real time. But there is one thing. They were able to trace the purchase of the phone to that of a Michael Lee King. Michael Lee King was no one special. He had no criminal record. He was a 37-year-old plumber who was out of work, down on his luck and facing foreclosure on his home. He was divorced from his wife, Danielle, who had left with their 12-year-old son. Michael, he came from a middle-class family of four boys out of Pontiac, Michigan. There is no direct reason as to why he picked Denise, that house, or any other motive for that day. Could have been as simple as just driving by seeing Denise out on the back porch cutting her, her young son's hair. End off. So Nate and Rick were still processing Denise's terrified voice over that phone call and what they could do when another phone call comes in. Almost 10 minutes like to the dot from the time Denise called in. At 6.23 p.m. a call comes in from Sabrina Muxlow, a woman called Sabrina Muxlow, and she was in fact related to Michael Lee King. She was the daughter of Michael Lee King's cousin, so I guess that would make her his second cousin. Sabrina had a very disturbing scene to report. Sabrina went on to tell the 911 operator that Michael had come to her dad's house. Michael's cousin, Harold, was his name, to borrow a shovel, a gas tank, and something else she, she couldn't remember. She had been given some story that his lawnmower had gotten stuck in a ditch and he needed to dig it out or something like some bullshit. So the shovel and the gas tank are alarming enough when you know that he's kidnapped somebody, right? But it gets just like a little, little, little bit worse, folks. Go ahead, caller. Yes, what's the problem? And the girl came out of the, like got out of the car and like uh, my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car and when she got out. Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. Sabrina went on to report that as her dad, Harold, was talking to Michael, a woman jumped out of Michael's car, screaming at Harold, Call the cops! And then she tried to run away. Michael grabbed her, pushed her back into the car, and then tells Harold, Ah, pff, Grant, don't worry about it. Harold was kind of just like, What the fuck did I just say? Okay, we've been looking for this female. You are just so wonderful to call us and give us this, this information. Okay? Yeah. Michael then took off with some terrified woman in the backseat. And then you got Harold, right, who's like, oh, oh boy, God, just, what, that, what was that all about? Call the cops? She told me to call the cops? What did she mean by that? Is that some kind of code? You know? Ooh, it's a real thinker. I think I need a beer after that one. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta dwell this over in the old noggin. He then called his daughter Sabrina to recount what had just happened, and then told her he wasn't really too comfortable calling the cops. So Sabrina called 911 to tell this whole story. I wish I was making all that up. Just seven minutes later, at 6.30 p.m., another 911 call came in. This time, it got routed to the Charlotte County District, the same office Denise's father worked in. The caller was a driver, Jane Kowalski, who wanted to report what she thought was a child abduction in action. She described coming to a stoplight and a dark-colored Camaro stopped beside her but she can hear the most anguished, terrifying cries coming from the car. Jane was thinking, what the hell's all this shit? She looks over at the driver, who's just staring dead ahead, but eventually kind of like makes eye contact with her, and Jane kind of, you know, gives him a look. You know, like, what the F is that sound coming from your car? I'm like, screaming? Have you got a very weird musical taste, or what's going on here? Then she sees a hand banging on the back window of the car. So, uh, yeah. Jane then called 911, describing in real time what was happening and what direction this Camaro was going in. She was ahead of King's car and trying to go slow so that so that he would pass her and she could then get his license plate. And I was at the flight and a man pulled up next to me and there was a child screaming in the car. Not a happy vehicle at the end. It's a blue Camaro, uh, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s. Or something. White male driver, and there was a child screaming in the car and banging on the window. Like I've got everybody hollering at me, and just one second. He's going to turn left on Toledo Blade. 
he's turning left right now. You want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay. Does he want her to follow him? Okay, can you turn? Oh, oh. He just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic and I can't get over. The 911 call, as you can hear, is chaos at best. The dispatcher was, was clearly flustered, unsure as to how to have Jane proceed, and trying to relay the information verbally to other dispatches, it appears. Maybe it was this 911 dispatcher's first day on the job, but hey, 911 recruiters, maybe don't uh, hire people who are going to get flustered like this person did. Jane was asking, you know, should I follow this person? What should I do? The abduction. Jane didn't have a clue. Like, most people wouldn't know if they're witnessing an abduction in real time. But it ended up being too late. Michael was driving right behind Jane the entire time, but he eventually makes a turn. She kept going forward. By the time she realized it was too late, she circles back around. He was gone. By this point, it was over three hours since Denise's abduction, and the police had tracked the phone to Michael King and to his residence. They arrived at his home at 6.42 p.m. By the looks of his home, they had just missed him. In the home, they found what can only be described as a, um, rape room with duct tape with long strands of hair stuck to it. This is a case which just got more and more horrific. By 6.40 p.m., the last 911 call came in for Denise. I'm not sure exactly what the emergency is exactly, but I think somebody that's been taken without their, uh, without their uh, don't want to be where they need to be. Uh-huh. And we're in a 95 green Camaro, Northport, somewhere. Okay. How do you know this? I know. The caller was trying to stay anonymous, calling from a payphone. He gave vague information, indicating that the girl seemed like she didn't want to be there, that the car was a green Camaro with a black bra on the front. The whole call was awkward, and it was finally revealed the caller was the father of the earlier caller, Serena. This was Michael's cousin, Harold Muxlow, the same Harold Muxlow who had to debate uh, when a woman who was clearly kidnapped screaming at him to call the cops. Yet, like, think that over and just like, you know. He confirmed that a white female was in Michael's car and seemed like she didn't want to be there. When the female operator asked if she thinks Michael would hurt the girl, he said he didn't know. From there, the police paid a visit to Harold's home, where he confirmed the earlier encounter with Michael, how he borrowed a shovel and a gas tank for his lawnmower, and how he watched while this woman jumped out of the car and yelled for him to call the cops, and then continued to witness Michael struggle with the girl for a good 30 seconds to get her back in the car. And after that then was silence. The leads stopped. There was no more 911 calls related to the case. Helicopters, dogs, troops from other counties that worked with Rick were volunteering their time. Old reporter friends that had worked with Rick, everyone and their dog, literally, came out to help look for Denise. And no more news came in. That is, until 9.16pm. Rick Goff had been listening to the police radio all night, waiting for news. Finally, a state trooper reported on the radio that he had pulled over a vehicle matching the Bolo, a 1995 green Camaro, with a black brow on the hood. The suspect was behind the wheel, but there was no sign of any female, no trace, just Michael King and a shovel. The news just continued to get worse as the state trooper asked Michael to step out of his car and, and Michael Lee King was soaked from the waist down. The shovel was muddy and the burner phone was found in his pockets with the battery removed. I'm here because I I need to find out to you what, what happened. You're the only person right now that can tell us what happened. We need to find where she is and we need to know, find out from you what was going on. No, it's fine, attorney. Back at the station, uh, the police allowed Michael to speak to his to his cousin Harold, and Michael had this batshit insane story of, of how both he and Denise, they were both victims of the kidnapping, if you can believe it. I know you can't. I'm not married. I told you that. I couldn't. I tried to put 911 on the phone and everything. Yeah, I mean, he didn't know where Denise was. He had been blindfolded. But Michael did take the police to uh, the loca location where he said they had been which was just some bogus random field out. He was wasting their time. Given the 911 calls, the witnesses, the duct tape found in his house, absolutely nobody believed his shite. He was arrested and charged that night. He stuck, though, to his bizarre shit story, and he never divulged where Denise was, if she was still alive. It was a long two more days of searching and scouring before the worst was confirmed. Denise's body was found in a shallow ditch, 
one single shot to the head. Her body was just half a mile from where Michael had been arrested. Over the next few days of interviews, police searches, and news reports, more things would come to light. Giving the story just a big old what if. Remember that 911 caller, Jane Kowalski. He's gonna turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. You want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay, if you want her to follow him. Well, she saw all of this on the news in the following days. And then so she called back up 911. I was like, hey, listen, you know, remember I, I was there. I made eye contact with Michael Lee King. If you need me to know, make a statement, testify, do whatever it is. I, I can come back in and tell you more of, you know, when I was trying to trying to find him, trying to follow him, whatever it was. When she called in saying all that, that was greeted by, huh? What? What call? There was no records from when she held, had called saying, I am looking at an abduction in real time. There was no information on that. In fact, when Jane was on the phone to the dispatcher saying, there's an abduction happening right here, there was a patrol car, like on that same street, very close by. They were just never informed of what was going on. In fact, the dispatcher that Jane was talking to pretty much recorded nothing about what was going on. The dispatcher was just yelling across the room about, you know, hey, this is happening, uh, listen to this. I've got everybody hollering at me and just one sec. The dispatcher was thinking somebody was paying attention to what she was yelling, that somebody was actioning it. Nobody was actioning it. She was just, nothing happened. And because there was so much chaos that night, it was forgotten about. Could things have been different? Could things have had a happy ending if, you know, maybe certain, um, whoa, 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 people didn't have butterfingers and co actually were, you know, competent? Who knows? It was gross negligence at the hands of Rick's own department. The 911 operators got a simple slap on the wrist, a few days suspension, and more training. The trial for Michael King began in August 2009. It would turn out he had visited a gun range on the morning of the crime, practicing his shots. He then kidnapped Denise Amberley from her home the afternoon of January 17, 2008. He took her to his home, where he tied her up and assaulted her several times, then forced her into the Camaro again to visit Harold's home to borrow the shovel and gas. That's when Denise jumped out of the car and yelled for him to call the cops. From there, witness Jane Kowalski saw Denise, what we know now was probably her last trip and likely en route to her final destination. She was found with a single gunshot wound to the head, her bra laying nearby. No gun has ever been recovered either. Given everything against him, Michael had the balls to plead not guilty. They gave him an IQ test, and he was far below average intelligence. No surprise there, and a traumatic event from his childhood was brought up, a devastating sledding accident that led to a divot in his reign. I mean, talk about reaching for straws, but then again, that is something we see again and again with killers, is that having a traumatic head injury when you're quite young, bump on the noggin, it can, you know, it can be an indi not an indicator, but, you know, past indicator. Michael Lee King's father was interviewed back in Michigan, and he was like, just my Michael. He's grand, never gave me any trouble. He's a good boy. More was divulged about Michael and his life before he killed Denise Lee. He lived at a home with his then-girlfriend and her children. Neighbors just thought he was a weirdo, but were now coming forward saying he was a neighborhood snoop and often peered into the windows of his neighbors and sometimes exposed himself even. One neighbor said her family's interactions with him were far more intimidating. They called the police on him numerous times for egging their house, slashing their tires, and pouring battery acid on their pool cage. Other than that though, the majority of his neighbors said he was just really standoffish and quiet, not talking to anyone really. He eventually moved out of that home, but it was thought the woman and her children remained there. It appears that family and friends collectively agreed that Michael had changed and became more erratic and odd after his divorce from his wife, and things seemed to go downhill from there. It took jurors approximately two hours to find Michael guilty on all counts, and he was sentenced to death on September 4th, 2009. For the murder of Denise Amber Lee, the defendant is sentenced to be put to death in the manner prescribed by law. With those words, Michael King is escorted out of the courtroom. The family of Denise Lee looks towards the heavens. Justice was served. Um, we had faith in the judicial system. Both state prosecutors and her family say the best witness throughout was Denise Lee herself. Without her, 
we'd still be looking for her. We'd still be looking for him. Um, she's the one who turned us on to him direct from the beginning with her 911 call. Her husband, Nathan Lee, spent the moment remembering the 21-year-old Northport mother of two. She's the most amazing person I've ever known, and I want to thank her for being an amazing wife and an amazing mom to our kids. Because his sentence was death, he was granted a mandatory appeal, and to save you all the details, he was found guilty again and his sentencing upheld December 2009. He appealed again in 2013, citing unfair uh, initial trial due to his brain injury and low IQ, among other things. King also cited that the form of death he was sentenced to, lethal injection, was barbaric, causing unnecessary suffering and harm. Again, it was denied, and his sentence was upheld in 2014. He is awaiting his death by a lethal injection in the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford, Florida. Due to the mishandling of the 911 call from Denise's case, Rick and Nate have worked hard to get additional training and mandatory certification for all 911 operators. You know, I guess our family uh, really decided early on that we were going to do what we had to do to, to honor Denise and, and make sure her death wasn't in vain. Following the 21-year-old's death, Lee had started the Denise Amber Lee Foundation. He speaks to and helps train 911 centers throughout the country using Denise's story. Which and there you have it. That is the case of Denise Amberley, a case where, you know, so many things could have and, and should have gone so different. I could have ended, like, there's so many times when Denise could have been saved, this could have been stopped, but it just kept slipping through everybody's fingers, through negligence, through incompetence, through just, um, being shitty. Really, that's probably the only way to say it too, I think. Everybody, everybody dropped the ball, basically. And it ended up costing a 21-year-old mother of two her life. You know, I like to end my uh, videos with a little jokey joke or something, but this one is like just, man, damn. It's kind of hard to think of a little pun this time, so, damn. Um, well, Shine. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it means the world to me, as always, folks, that you're here. Uh, so yeah, here, listen, next video, will be up in a couple of days, so please uh, look forward to that. And, you know, there's got like lots of videos. Or we'll also check out the That Chapter podcast, which has a brand new episode out every single Monday. We just did a two-parter on the DC Snipers. Next week, we're doing Gerald John Schaefer, uh, the serial killer butcher. And then after that, there's some weird stories of a jetpack murder and massacres in chicken shops and all that sort of stuff. So give it a go. Um, but yeah. Listen, until then, I'll talk to you, you know? Please take care of each other and yourselves because guess what? Guess what? I love you. My gift. <laughs>